Evil Genius is saying from Team Seagram. Once again, Yaps are on the front line. The Whoa, match. it's a three-man stop. Three-man stop. Three-man stop. Three-man yeah, three kill. EG, they are the real three. Even though they're guaranteed two, they'll lose another one. So Mount pushed back out, but Min one's chasing him down. Now he'll drop the rock, combining with the Battle Bonds. Team Seagram is all connected together. They had some dispels. They need a spear. They need something to hit. They only pop the A on disc. And Puppy, he's in the trees looking for his own shackle under the cover of their ghost. Oh, the the double stop from Gamsol. They've got the control. They've got the control of this fight. And they've got EG down. Calling QG. It's done. Team Secret in five games. What is up, you fine people? And welcome to Esports in 30. I'm Brody, and that is Nick. And today we're doing something a little different. Normally, when it's us on the couch, we're talking Rocket League. But we're still waiting for LAN to come around. So we thought we'd give some Dota 2 love. And I know you love Dota 2. Man, Dota 2 is the purest esport. And every time we get a chance to talk about it, I'm so excited. But Rocket League is still your favorite, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> So what did we see this weekend? Uh, it wasn't a DPC tournament, but it was super exciting. Lots of great storylines mm -hmm. and an amazing crowd. ESL won Birmingham in England. So a fantastic tournament. Definitely a lot to talk about as it per pertains to DPC. Why don't we get into it? As you mentioned, it might not have been a DPC tournament, but ESL won Birmingham had so much action. And on the other side of these highlights, we'll keep diving into it with the help of caster Darren Killer Pigeon Elmi. Check it out. Starts it off new, the Timbs are going to initiate in the raw salt mine again. Salt mine came a little bit later, however. Oh but my god, the needle for the needle! I told you! They have just destroyed them! <laughs> Miracle, maybe now Matalman's back alive. The fortification, important more time, but you don't have your Arc Warden, so all the pressure is on the Matalman. He needs Nobody to find this kill with a quick push up. They're looking for the kill over from Paparazzi. The Urn is doing the work, he's going to get himself back out to so the base. Ori's so low, hexed up. The smoke is going to spin for the bleed, the shackle, GH! He actually caught Pepperanti on the retreat! 30 HP on Ori, he's moving in the trees to practice the vision, GH gets the double kill! It oh, and actually fail. lands onto the SF, he pops his BKB, picks up the battery route, S4 in the back line, look at that dream coil, locking down the four of them, there is going to be the BKB activated, but they're wasting so much time trying to oh, kill S4, the triple race. just controlling up everybody right now, Yaps are the last shot to the high ground, he's going to be able to find him for the ultra kill, he wants the mail, and now the silence slow down onto mid one, who no longer has his BKB, what a setup from S4! Yeah. Gonna start off poking a mid one here, but now the four sat four going for Tim's. Tim's not a three man storeful by oh. the a beautiful setup with the side blades. They all get vaporized with this fast movement speed. They actually caught one. That's gonna be GH Shadow Shop. He immediately buys back. That's gonna be two curl dice as well. But there goes Matumba Man. Does manage to find Evan G the stampede and he just runs away. Burrow strike on it too. But my control, he just came back and now he's dead. They're gonna buy back on their supports as well. But Super War's down. Apple's almost dead. Trying to finish him off. He actually does manage to go scepter a little bit and he's gonna be okay. That's actually the uh, Agon Scepter from the soul, so buying him more time on these ages than is just the first life, though. A lot of Gambit are quite low, though. Miracle turning in. He actually got the beat up on some multiple heroes and they get the damage up, but now Miracle's controlled up. They can't let him die here. He's being controlled the force down. BKB turn around. He actually gets it. He's gonna be able to kill one fighting dog. Right, S4 is going side to side, but the stun is a double with the mass of force. S4 is trapped inside the wound force. Come on, Crew wants to help out, but what can he do? He can put down oh the arena. Oh my god. What a skill with the fatal one. Team Secret, they are bleeding together. Team Secret, they have to get the hell out what they've got. Our the team's in secret. There's your jump forward. And do they get this kill? Where's the support? Chris moving forward. They're taking so damn long together. And the double start! Oh He's just God. in the back line. Flying Chris beyond the disaster. They're going to get three heroes down from EG. Moving into S4. No point for the Ravage because this fight is over. In fact, it's going to be an entire, entire team wipe. Samalk and BKB looking for revenge on the side. But the Clipper came from Yapsaw. It just cancels everything. EG have nothing. Mid one has an ultra kill. Same from Team Seagram once again. Yaps are on the front line. The oh, it's a three man stop! Three man stop! Three man stop! Yes, yeah, three man kill! EG, they are the real three, even though they're guaranteed two. They'll lose another one. So Mount push back out, but mid one's chasing him down. Now he'll drop the rock, combining with the battle bonds. Team Seagram is all connected together. They had some dispels. They need a spear, they need something to hit. They only pop the A on disc as Pumpy. He's in the trees looking for his own shackle under the cover of their ghost. Oh, that's a double stop from Yaps. They've got the control. They've got the control of this fight. And they've got EG down. Call it GG. Yeah, I just can't stop Team, team Secret, Secret these days as they walk away. One trophy, games. one Mercedes, and $125,000 richer. And joining us today to talk about the matters in Birmingham is Killer Pigeon. What's up, man? 
Hey, what's up, guys? Pleasure to be on the show. Uh, just here to talk about some dotes. Yes, yeah, you are. <laughs> and a pleasure to have you. Let's start right off the bat with the winners. Uh, they kind of had, we all know the secret is an insanely good team, but this time it felt like they did something a little bit different than usual, which is they went to the lower bracket and from there ran it because we see them winning the tournaments from uh, winner's bracket all the time, not so much doing a loser bracket run. So this, this, we kind of maybe knew they were capable of this, but does seeing it make secret that much scarier heading towards kind of the back last couple tournaments before TI? I mean, there's, there's so many variables to consider. Like, there was a lot of jokes originally going around that maybe Secret just went down to low bracket so they could dodge uh, doing any interviews for the event, which would be a smart move. They don't want to do media. But I, I think there's, like, another argument to this, and that the patch dropped just before the tournament, and thus there were kind of new things up in the air, right? And I think that there was a big example of that with certain teams like TNC taking a surprising amount of victories against very top-tier teams. Uh, and an element of that came in some of the kind of drafts where they got things like Chen and Wraith King, which uh, that combo alone, if you got your hands on that, like Chen, once the patch dropped, was ridiculous, Warlock. So it was just this kind of experimentation discovery. It's nice to see in Dota every once in a while, but you don't really get it with DPC events because DPC events are like, they're actually stationed a few weeks after a patch at least, mm -hmm. right? So you don't actually get this kind of last minute, uh oh, I didn't realize this was OP. What's going on, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. That's yeah. true. Uh, now, I, I want to be on this team too, because it's like, it seems like everyone's going to be benched out soon. Um, with Puppy, of course, winning the uh, tournament MVP and getting that free Mercedes, but it really could have happened to like anyone on Secret. They're all insane. Can you talk to us about the two members who have yet to get that free car in Nisha and Yapsor and what they bring to the team? Sure. So, like, there's an argument that anyone could have won that there. Yapsor is kind of a standout. I think a lot of people were talking about Zai for this tournament. They thought Zai was mm. actually the most likely to get MVP. But it's this kind of issue, like, it's similar to, uh, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about Liquid as an example, because RIP, uh, their roster changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're in the same example of a team where you've got many star players, right? And, like, one of the great things about when you look at Secret is they have this kind of greedy style that works because everyone's willing to give way, right? So Yaps and Zai, they're, they're more of a 3.5 than a 4 and a 3. Uh, mid one, Anisha, they're, they're kind of willing to look, see who's actually winning, who's doing well, mm -hmm. and then whoever's doing better, like the other one steps aside, right? It's like if mid one has had a slightly rougher time than Nisha, but like, okay, Nisha, you, you just go farm, you get all the items you need, I will play space creator for like the next 20 minutes. And, and it's kind of that dynamic that makes it very hard for a team to adjust to them. Whereas you look at other teams, you know, the star players, there's very obvious people that are dominant, and a team will go and they'll go, that guy, we shut that guy down and out. Fine. But when you've got like a team of arguably all stars in their own rights, yeah. it's, it's a wild card upon a wild so, card, right? Who, like, do you agree with that MVP choice or like, would you have changed it up at all? I think it's a tough one because like there was some very good drafts and then you've got actually that like pretty heavily to mm -hmm. Puppy, I think. Uh, he has some standout performances. I think if you're looking at like ultra amazing, over the moon, like ridiculous plays, Zai had the most in that tournament, which is why a lot of people were kind of shouting yeah. out for Zai. Followed probably by Yapsor, but you know, it, it's kind of partially caused by the meta that Dota is in right now, where the four, uh, especially, can actually look remarkably game changing compared mm -hmm. to any other role. And the three, like, because of the timings around the 20, 25 minute mark, where you're looking to just start to ramp up into erosion on high ground, that's suited most towards the offlaners because they build these items that kind of peak in the mid game more often than not. Mm -hmm. Cool. I want to take a look quickly at uh, Evil Geniuses, the team that Secret mm. overcame in the finals to win the trophy. And it seems for Evil Geniuses, every time they get they encounter Secret, they just can't beat so them. Close. So break down how these two teams kind of stack up against each other and why Secret is such kind of like that final obstacle for EG in a lot of cases. Yeah, so EG are a team that have been a bit of a meme in terms of positioning, right? <laughs> like it's always third place, never above. They, they got above though, they got second. That's, that's an achievement, they're, they're getting there. It's not a DPC event, but they're one off. <laughs> um, and honestly, like they pushed Secret pretty well. I'd say that this was the best grand final of the year so far. Uh, you know, I'm gonna say so far, just in case someone watches this a few months back and goes, well, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna trip myself up, but EG is this team that they do have a lot of star players similar to Secret, right? And they're starting to get back to this kind of idea that Sumail can play more of these kind of just playmaker styling on you type heroes than being given the very boring kind of raises and death profits of the land, right? Mm -hmm. And that does allow him to come and shine. And RTC is always a guy that, you know, for a long time was regarded as as the god of Dar. And then obviously when Sumel came in, it was kind of a, sh a shift because he had to be the stable carry, whereas 
you then expect Sumail to be this playmaker. I think mm -hmm. they're starting to get into this this kind of motion similar to Secret, where whoever gets a good start can take the lead in the mid game. And I think like this tournament, Gustav S4 was a perfect example of that, right? Like he had a lot of games where he was top of net worth. Like arguably some of them are a bit cheeky because they're doomed, but he was able to actually just kind of plummet through the laning phase out of control. And then the team would actually back him up and play around that. So it, they're getting there. I think this, I still want to see RTZ shine more. because I feel like he's trying to be the kind of stable quiet carry a lot of the time because sure, like these big players from S4 and Sumail will outshine him. But he still has his moments and he's proven time and time again, he's still capable. And, mm -hmm. and in some way, maybe going against his, his nature, as you said, in his history as a, as a big time playmaker. Yeah, it's, it's like hard to actually step back from that, right? Like if you're known as the star of a team to like go away from that, I mean, you can look at other sports where this sort of stuff happened, right? Like, think, think Shroud from C9 and CSGO. Let me get about shooters for a second. Like, that was a guy who was like a pub star, and he came in, and it kind of felt mm -hmm. like it was all about him. But then he got rotated to more of a supportive role, and then it just didn't fit. It, it's not something suited to everyone, no matter the esport. Like, a Matumba man who just left Liquid. Mm -hmm. Like, he's an example of a very, very rare breed of player, because he's, he's argued as one of the most selfless characters, selfless cause in the game. And it's hard to get that because, you know, to be this good, to get this high up, you kind of do have to have a little bit of an ego, right? Mm -hmm. You know, anything you do in life, you are kind of aiming for the top. Most people are aiming for the top. So to reach the top, you have to believe in yourself and you, you want to be able to actually be free to make those moves. But to dial it back is sometimes the harder choice. All right, I wanna, I wanna move on to um, Gambit because kind of caught us off guard here. Um, they weren't even supposed to be there until Virtus Pro uh, had to back out, right? But then they ended up taking down Vici and Liquid as well. well great I, teams. Yeah, and lo losing to Secret, but that's that's fine, right? Secret popped off. So were you caught off guard like we were uh, by what Gambit brought to the table here? So I was kind of, of mixed in the, I saw her, I was like, Gambit, they've been up and down a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's hard to see where they're gonna be going into this. Like, they're just replacing VP. You know they're going to be number two in the CIS region because Virtus Pro is so damn dominant. And honestly, CIS region has its own issues when it comes to like uh, roster stability, getting individual talent together based around like the very rough and um, obscure contracts that mm. are involved in a lot of players. But Gambit is kind of the hope for them right now, especially after uh, No Pangalia kind of fell apart. But I think when you look at the way that the Gambit played, um, they kind of exploited the patch a little bit. They have the kind of flavor pick, especially the Shadow Fiend, right? Shadow Fiend mid for them is something not a lot of teams do. And Afo has a way of playing it that really forces to be banned. With. But I think the standout moment for everyone that took them by surprise, which was kind of funny to me, because like uh, me, me and my co cast have been there chuckling the whole time. It's like, why is it surprising? We've seen this for ages, but yeah. I guess most hadn't is immersion uh in the post four role he had a nurse for a game where i think he had something like 17 kills one death and 18 assists it was an insane amount and people were like my god this guy's a god how do we not see this coming it's like arguably like i'd, I'd say right now you know you've got the obvious really good earth spirit players like jerax and gh that people always think of yaps or as well mm -hmm. but i think there's never enough credit given to these these kind of guys that are grinding out there and they don't actually always get the chance to shine but when they do they prove it and, and gh I'd also say Tiger uh, is another one from the tier two, tier one team list that kind of haven't really been given the, the day to shine. Uh, Immersion of course has, and he's proven that he can. And, and this is kind of an interesting thing for Gambit because they need that kind of star post four player. Mm -hmm. If they can start to draft more heavily around that, I think the meta still favors teams that are very focused on their post four being the playmaker. And FNG is a guy who's always had a very unique perspective on the meta and the way it should draft. Mm -hmm. And he actually, in fairness, he was like, he, he came into Gambit and he switched things around. So yeah. I think Gambit still have a lot of potential, uh, but they, they, in some ways it still feels like a young team. It still feels like they're making some kind of irrational mistakes or they're rushing a little bit, which is kind of classical for the CIS though. You think, do you think co like coaching will clean that up or is that on the players to kind of get their heads uh, into it? You could try and get a coach. I just think like there's a big problem. There's a very scarce amount of coaches available mm. in the CIS region, like people who can speak the language who are yeah. respected by the players, right? Um, I mean, some teams are even essentially using their friends. Like I'm, I'm not going to name teams, but like they got no history. And then you find out they're just buddies with the captain. Yeah. It, it, it's a different type of coach though, in fairness. Like we're getting to a stage in, in esports where you don't just have your former pro, right? You have your stat person. You can have your psychological coach. Yeah. So there's many different angles. Um, I think like there's maybe a big 
opportunity miss for teams like that. Uh, I'd say Kips is one of the big coaches mm -hmm. comes to the list of people who are outside the scene but can actually negotiate within that scene because she did coach for Vega for a long time. Yeah. But when you look inside, there's barely anyone, right? Like a lot of the CIS players still want to play. A lot of them are kind of getting old now, but they're like, no, yeah. no, there's only one dominant CIS team, so I can still make it. Uh, I wanted to, we touched on it a little bit earlier, but I want to go to Liquid because as we, you know, you kind of alluded to it, Matoma Man is off the team. And for a team that just at the start of May went to the MDL major and finished second, came into Birmingham, got eliminated by Gambit at last place in the bracket, and now Matoma Man all of a sudden on the bench. So can you maybe try and get into Liquid headspace where they're at right now? Because this kind of came out of nowhere for a lot of people. Uh... Sort of came out of nowhere just because of the recent results, but I think most people expected something like this for quite some time. It's just when you look at this roster and how long they've been together, I think you get to a stage, you pass the stage, but you don't think it's ever going to happen because they've been together too long, right? Let's be buddy buddy. Um, the reality is, I think something had to happen for a long time for Liquid. Something's clearly not been working. They haven't really been changed their playstyle. I think Kuroki even hit on this in an interview. He said, We haven't really changed our playstyle. Uh, we've been figured out, right? So at that stage, you either change your playstyle or you shift the roster around, which should force a change of playstyle anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And in most people's eyes, when they saw the lineup, when you see Mind Control regularly popping off and, and you see GH regularly popping off and Kura's captain, of course, and, you know, even Miracle, like he had a 1v5 rampage at Birmingham, which was a first never seen before in Dark. Mm -hmm. You then go, what about Matumba Man? And you go, okay. That seems like the guy is not popping off that much. But you have to realize the role that he's playing the team is, I think it's going to be very hard yeah. for Liquid to replace that. They need to find someone who can potentially pop off like Miracle, but the, you know, they start playing their own right, but they are able to just take the back burner. And I'm trying to, it's hard to think of like existing talent that can do that. And when you get new players, like I'd say you've got a big ego on new players. Like when you pick them up, they want to prove themselves. They feel this need, to, right? They they want to be the star of the team. They want to prove themselves. So I, I think it's going to be tough. Uh, Liquid do not have very long until the major to find a replacement, at least. Um, but I'm more heartbroken than the Timberman. I really hope that guy does find a team before the TI qualifies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it would be a shame to lose a, a talented player and a TI champion like Matoma Man out of the scene for sure. And like yeah, you said, with, with such, such a short amount of time here, there, there's really not that much spot, places for him to go. And it feels like a lot of Europe as well, if you want to stay in Europe, is kind of jammed up at the one position as well. Yeah, I mean, hell, you, you actually look at it. you got people like PyCat, for example, who uh, is a pretty skilled player, pretty respected player. He's not got a team at all. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you just got more competitive, actually, when you think about the fact that Chaos came across, right? A team that was SA, hit most of the SA roster, they kept HF and their carry. But now, like, that's more people being sucked into teams, which is less to then construct a new team scratch, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it's kind of the crux of it, right? Is there's so much competition in Europe, but more people being deterred to actually hang around Europe, more people being kind of encouraged to go to different locations. Like, you look at... Uh, I think it's infamous, right? They've got Skidder, they've got Black, they've got these European players that have escaped essentially from European qualifiers in the SA region. It's a bit cheeky me say, but you know, it's, like when you look at it, it's how it's actually gone down. And it makes sense because I'd say Europe is by far the most competitive region right now. Uh, you look at NA, for example, you know, you've, you've got kind of Complexity and J Storm, uh, who are like, or, and Ford, of course, who are like, there, but they're always below EG. Mm -hmm. There's no one really competing with EG. Whereas you look at Europe, you got like Secret, uh, OG, uh, at least right at the top. And then below them, you could arguably have like Liquid and Ninja in the Pajamas kind of inconsistent, but they could be kind of seen in the running. You know, mm -hmm. There's a lot more teams and a lot more competition in those separate tiers than there is in NA. Well, let's let's talk on the potential too uh, for a team in uh, in Alliance. Um, you know, they didn't really have a, a good showing there, but it seems like their their potential I like Alliance should, should be potential. should be higher. But like, are are we actually seeing the ceiling of this scheme? Uh, this uh, sorry, this team, or is it just just showing how competitive every team is? Uh, I absolutely don't think we've seen the similar team. I, I so I started casting last year, and from an early point, I like got involved in regularly casting Alliance. Mm -hmm. You come to kind of understand the team, and it's kind of a beautiful thing when you keep watching the team and you see them grow. And that's what I've seen over the last year is constant growth out of this team. Like you compare them to the reckless youth of, of their beginning, and it's a completely different yeah. roster. They're always evolving. I think Alliance, it was very shocking that they didn't make it through the playoffs. I didn't see them winning this, but I did at least see them making it to the playoffs. And I think part of that does still come down to uh, the patch drop. 
and certain teams being better or worse adapting and having different ideas that are better or worse, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what was that? I believe Alliance they took only two games, so two A, and I believe those two were from Secret, which you know Secret struggled in the group stage as well. Like it, it kind of says itself, there's an experimentation phase there. So I expected Alliance to at least get four wins in the group stage. I think they, like I said, Tiger, he's a member of Alliance. I think he's one of the standout fours, cut up and coming. Uh, Mike was a hotly contender and sought after pick after TI. A lot of teams were interested. Mm -hmm. Lions had to fight really hard to keep their hands on him. Like he's seen as one of the um, the next miracles potentially. A uh, quick, uh, I think it's good to have kind of one of these more veteran, old school players. They bring something original, something older, and you mesh it with the newer. And then you've got to keep in mind, like I, I just don't see the whole roster breaking apart anytime soon. Like Boxy has come through and through. I remember, let's say, how long ago was it? It's about. Half a year, eight months ago, I used to say to people, if you want to win against Alliance, ban out against Boxy. Because this guy knew only like three or four heroes. Yeah. And you know, they, maybe people are like, why are you playing Boxy? Well, I, I can't flame him anymore. He's increased his hero pool. Maybe he's only doubled it, but it's enough that you can't ban him out. You can't tug him out anymore. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, like I just don't see Insania and Mike breaking up anytime soon. Like most people don't realize that those guys have been playing together for about seven years, I think because they used to play Heroes New Earth together for a very long time. So there, you know, there's an argument that you get to a point where the bond is so strong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then again, we just had Liquid kind of, you know, yeah. split up a little bit, so you never know. But I think, I, I, I've talked to some Alliance guys, they're happy with their growth. They're not happy they're not winning. I mean, no one's happy they're not winning, but they yeah, well, yeah. definitely feel yeah, like they're improving. And we are seeing some of that, uh, you know, some of the results coming in with them uh, currently playing in the minor and they're topping their group. And we might see them at the Epicenter Major, which is fantastic. I want to touch on uh, one of the final teams here we've got from Birmingham, which was PSG LGD. Mm -hmm. So obviously a very strong team, pretty good year so far, but it doesn't seem like they're kind of matching that pre-TI form. Another question form. on their cap. Yeah, yeah. We, got, we got out of them, say, in the back third of last year, shall we say. So what will it take for PSG LGD to reach that level we know we can get heading into TI? And that, that's a hard question to answer. Like, I, I look at the way the LGD are you playing, <laughs> and hey, you know, that's how you earn in the box. But um, you look at the way they're playing, and like individually, a lot of these players have very, very clear tier one skills that could be picked mm -hmm. up any team. I, I feel like there's kind of a weird dynamic at play sometimes. Like, when the boss one is popping off, the boss two isn't, right? Like, it's always one or the other. It's never both of them. Um, and that's kind of fine. Like you look at most teams and you kind of expect that. Like that's how it usually works is one player has a good lane. We mentioned as a secret, the other one falls in line. But it seems like there's come kind of some questionable plays. The aggression that they were so infamous for for a long time seems to start backfiring on them, right? It's like mm -hmm. me watching some CIS teams where like, okay, they just made a really aggressive play and oh no, they've been stopped. They don't know what to do for five minutes. Mm -hmm. It's actually really interesting to look uh, at X Nova, especially. Like this is a guy who used to top, like especially around TI, in TI. Like uh, after like TI, one of the biggest talking points was X Nova's warding. Like he was revolutionary. The way he was doing it, everyone's watching him studying it. And they seem to have caught on and they seem to have figured it out and they seem to have shut him out because whenever you look at the stats after these games, like at least all the ones I've seen, it's really low amount of like D wards from him and very high D wards from his opponents. So it kind of feels like he's been found out and he needs to kind of evolve his vision game a little bit more. Um, um, no, sorry. I, I just okay. I, I was just thinking uh, forward a bit here because we're, we're almost out of time and I do want to uh, touch on it. Um, I, I've seen a new champ being used and uh, Nick. Hero. Or, sorry, hero, hero. Sorry, sorry. Um, a new hero being used and uh, I was playing a lot of roller champs. That's why it's in my mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, if you want to talk to me about Mars real quick and kind of the meta, how we're going to see that change anything or uh, if it's going to make any changes. Yeah, so uh, Mars' latest addition to the hero pool is pretty ridiculous for all intents and purposes. Uh, there's a reason that he's got, I think he had one of the highest picked fan rates of the entire tournament, no surprise there. Like the nature of this hero is that fundamentally he's going to seem broken for quite a while. Because at the core of all his mechanics is Spear of Mars. The Spear of Mars is the ability that if you get pinned to something, you get stunned. But more importantly, it repositions you, right? And like repositioning is one of the most underrated aspects of at all. Like mm -hmm. people know it's there, right? People buy four stuff to reposition, but you rarely see the use of them aggressively, right? But whenever you do, you're like, my God, that just won a fight. Yeah. Um, and Mars is just ridiculous in that he can get behind you, put you out of position, potentially stun you as well. Yeah. 
I think if they look to balance this hero, which they probably are going to look to tweak him more, they can't change the Spear of Mars. Spear of Mars has to stay the same. Like every Dota hero has its strengths and its weaknesses. Mm -hmm. The best balancing decisions are always made when we amplify the strengths and the weaknesses, right? So like, like we have to have drawbacks for every gains we get. And I think maybe around Arena of Mars, I think one way they could go about it is if you step out of your arena, uh, it could just do something. Because the arena is like super powerful and arguably it's only weak at level one because of the cooldown. I expect that's where they'll try and make the hero fall in line more. His passive is nice, but the reality is like it's 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 a style that's not one step back, right? Like you take less damage from the front and the sides. So the moment you turn around to run like a coward, you just gonna get shot down instant. Yeah. And then the, the cleave from God's Rebuke is cute. It's nice. They released an Ags. Uh the Ags felt kind of meany for me. I can see some value in it, but I definitely think moving forward they will likely tweak his ultimate a bit maybe mm. his starting stats and then the hero should fall in line that's fair i just want to take a quick step back here for our last topic uh because I, I had a question that came about from just watching this tournament obviously the english fans uh, in Birmingham always amazing and every time it seems esl or any other tournament goes there there's some talk about maybe maybe ti should go to england in the future however to the best of my knowledge there really hasn't been kind of like a super successful high level pro player from england which is where like you know in a lot of other esports that kind of the players come first and then the fans come after so from that perspective what makes england such a great dota nation despite kind of not having that player history that you might expect i mean we we, we tried like, <laughs> come we on why you gotta well, remind me <laughs> we true yeah you gotta keep bringing up hey hey i tried, to, fairness, I tried to phrase it in the nicest way i could <laughs> You're like, I'm just going to flame lightly here. But no, like, so, um, like, in fairness, we have T-Gov now, who is the coach for Chaos, right? Like, I think what Dota has really been lacking for a long time is a good role model. And I think okay. T is an example of, of what a good role model looks like, right? You think about the people that got people into Dota. Uh, Sing Sing's a big example. Yeah, he might troll in his games, but he's funny, he's enjoyable when he does it. And now you look like a, you look at, like, the current choice of people. When, when you want to get new people in the game and you, like, open up the browser... And, and you go searching on Twitch and you find like, uh, I don't know, let's say, I'm going to shower Envy here. I'm going to grill Envy a bit because it's the most prominent example <laughs> of mind. He starts to lose his game and he walks down mid, right? Like, that doesn't look fun to people. That doesn't engage with people. That doesn't make the game fun or enjoyable for people. That doesn't make me want to go play the game, right? Yeah. Someone like T-Governor is a good example. I think, like, UK has had poor role models when it comes to high MMR players so mm. far, at least ones that have been in the limelight. Um, whereas T Governor has more of kind of uh, an understanding and, and respectful aspect. You know, I've heard from many different pro players who've played with him. It's like this guy is, yeah, he's fine. I've got no problems with him. He doesn't flame. Like he keeps an eye on his own game and he gives a little bit of advice. That's great. And if we get more people like that, maybe we start to breach through into the pro scene. But I think at the same time, like looking at it from the perspective now that we don't have pro players, what makes the UK golden, in yeah. my opinion, for like a TI or major next circuit? is the fact that part of what makes it great is that we don't have any pro players. We don't have a horse in the race, right? Still, we see good dollar, yeah. we cheer, we go mad, right? We adopt teams as our own and, and everyone comes together at the end to just marvel in the Dota. And I haven't seen that at many different, like, big events in different countries. I mean, yeah. I, I've been to Russia and I've done a big LAN and I can give you an example of how, like, like grim the comparison is, right? On one side, you had a Russian team. On the other, you had a Chinese team. And... The Russian team would make like the simplest kill in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yeah, amazing blood sport, right? The Chinese team would like pull off a very sophisticated rotation, and uh, yes, it's sophisticated, but the, the you can tell as a viewer, it's a really good play. They wipe out like three members, and there's absolute silence, right? Yeah. But you never get that. You never get that in Birmingham. Never got that in Birmingham at all, yeah. right? And, and this kind of like expands on a whole other issue you go into about TI and how one side is maybe going to be when you get to China and probably 80 to 90 percent of the people spectating the stadium are going to be Chinese are we going to have the same wow that we've had at previous years because like what made TIA so great you got to the finals of the split it was east versus yeah. west mm -hmm. right and it's like cheering for both sides yeah and I, 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 I always get upset when we see these different tournaments that get that experience like that, that's what Epicenter had last year I'm really scared that TI9 is going to have that this year is this really one-sided crowd that makes it kind of sad to watch, yeah. right? It's like, am I watching Dota or am I watching a golf game? Yeah. Hey, man, I got to say, the best events I've been to have been uh, uh, in England as well. But uh, Neutral territory for Dota, right? Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyways, Killer, we are out of time right now, but thank you so much for dropping by and sharing your insight on some ESL1 Birmingham, and hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure to tune in.
That was a great talk, uh, but I had to, you know, end it off because I still want to get some thoughts from you here, sure. and we're almost out of time, so why don't you just get into it? Do you agree with this MVP? What is your MVP for Birmingham? Yeah, I think ESL1 did a good job with this one. Puppy uh, deserves it. In the past couple of times I've handed out MVPs for Dota tournaments, I've leaned towards the carries, right? Because mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're putting someone in a position to be that player, they need to deliver, and they did. Uh, but this time, as uh, Pigeon was saying, you know, yeah. it was a very a different meta, a new patch, lots of drafting complex, you know, mm -hmm. lots of drafting complexities going on. And when your leader is the guy that's figuring all that out kind of live in being a tournament to it, yeah. and being able to do it and not only that but doing it from the losers bracket where you've got lots of games happening pressure. and you've got lots of teams in ahead of you and you've got lots of pressure on you to not only put together some really solid drafts and figure out the meta kind of in real time but also deliver some pretty solid gameplay mm -hmm. not flashy puppy is very rarely flashy these days but just very solid uh, i think that puppy is more than deserving of mvp for this one well i don't know enough to argue so <laughs> my notes are telling me we're done that's it no more thank you to killer pigeon for calling in and thank you nick of course for helping me through all of this tomorrow we've got an fps double header but until then check out all the socials and we'll see you later